It is now my pleasure to turn the webcast over to Michael Wolk, partner with SunGuard Consulting Services. Mr. Wolk, the floor is yours. Thank you, Emma. Hello, and welcome to our BI Maturity Survey webcast, where we will be briefing you on the feedback and insights gained from our recent business intelligence survey. Again, I'm Mike Wolk, partner with SunGuard Consulting Services, and together with Scott Lundstrom from IDC, we will be presenting today's webinar. Scott and I will be presenting the survey insights with a focus on the value that BI can bring to an organization and best practices to implement BI in practical ways. First, a high-level definition of business intelligence, or BI as we call it. BI is being used by many firms today to bring together data, information technology tools, and knowledge to improve the business. BI capabilities enable analysis of large volumes of data into actionable business information. Other terms you may have heard include data marts, data warehouses, and bridging into big data or information management. But at SES, we include the three dimensions of implementing BI in our BI maturity model. One, the technical side. Two, the functional side, meeting functional requirements and adding value to your company. And three, the program and project management capabilities organizations need to implement BI, including data governance and data stewardship. We will define and elaborate more about the BI maturity model in today's webinar. So let's begin. Our agenda for today is fairly straightforward. We will have just do a quick introduction of myself and Scott and our firms. We'll talk about business intelligence maturity model and our survey approach. We'll spend the vast majority of our time today on our survey insights. We have six key insights we're going to share with you and share some practical examples. Then we'll talk about where is your firm and how Sungar Consulting can help. And at the end of our presentation today, we'll take a question and answer session. First, introductions. Again, I'm Mike Wolk. I'm a partner with Sungar Consulting Services. I've been in the consulting IT business for over 25 years, and I've had a focus on information management for the last 10 years. Scott, I'll hand off for, so you can do your introduction. Thank you, Michael. So I'm Scott Lundstrom. I'm the Group Vice President and General Manager of IDC Financial Insights. Um, I, I spent about the last 15 years as an analyst and Prior to that, uh, about 20 years, um, really, in, in the seats many of you occupy as a, a practitioner in this world, um, worked as a DBA and a development tool specialist um, in the commercial software business for many years before being an analyst. So pleasure to be here today and, and to share some insights from the SunGuard study. Thank you, Scott. Now, Scott and I will just give a, just a brief overview of our organizations. For those of you joining us who may not know SunGuard, I just want to provide a high-level overview of our company. Uh, we are a global uh, software and IT services provider to the financial services and energy industry. We have over 16,000 customers in 70 countries and over 13,000 employees. Um, and we are the third largest business applications company behind a couple big names that you all know. Uh, we are a privately held firm, uh, and we do rank in the Fortune 500 in terms of size. And we also serve over 25 of the largest financial services companies uh, globally. Scott, I'll hand off to you for an overview of IDC. Sure. So IDC um, has really just celebrated our 50th anniversary. Um, we were founded by Pat McGovern a as an institution really to look at the technical change of the last generation of technology. We've grown to be a, a global research provider um, that uh, is now part of, of IDC's broader operation in the financial services group. We have 18 full-time analysts focused exclusively on financial services um, in the U.S., uh, Europe, Asia Pacific, and Latin America. Um, we're also backed up by the broader IDC team of 1,000 technology analysts covering um, technical uh, developments and products in 110 countries. 
Um, we serve a, a diverse and, and growing client base, um, including both um, technical professionals and executives in, in companies that utilize this technology as well as suppliers to that market. So again, a, a pleasure to be here today, and I'd encourage you to, to take a look at our research, and I, I think you'll find a broad range of technical analysis and advice that can inform your project decision making. Thank you, Scott. So the next couple of slides, uh, Scott and I are going to give an overview of you know this survey and a little bit more about you know our perspective and the insights and how we uh, under gained these insights. First off, we wanted to understand the BI challenges that organizations face. You know how important is business intelligence to to these companies to your to your company. Um, does your company provide business users with the strategic reporting and analytic capabilities that they need? Do you have enterprise-wide reporting capabilities? And a hot topic we noted is data stewardship, data ownership. Or do you still rely on spreadsheets and manual data manipulation? To help us understand the answers to these questions, we structured the survey in looking at three topic areas where our questions focused. The first was around business enablement, so how well is information delivered to the business and IT users. We looked at technology enablement, how effective are the BI tools and information reporting capabilities that organizations implement. And we looked at program management. Does the organization have the IT governance and data stewardship in place to support your BI investments? So these three dimensions, business enablement, program management, and technology enablement, form the framework behind our BI maturity model. And uh, I'll do more of a, a discussion about the BI model uh, later in today's webinar. But from this, web, from this model, we were able to gather six key insights, and that's what Scott and I will be discussing today on our webinar. So a little more context about the survey. Uh, we did a survey this past spring. It was a web-based global survey. And we wanted to explore these and other questions regarding BI deployment and use. The survey, uh, we received results from over 200 financial services and energy industry executives. And again, we examined the current state of BI maturity in the two industry sectors and what firms are doing to improve their BI capabilities. So we thought that was a very good uh, set of responses and a very super response to our survey. So now let's discuss the insights. Again, we're going, Scott and I are going to review the six key insights that we learned from our survey results. Insight number one in our survey revealed that the priority placed on business intelligence continues to heighten but many organizations still are challenged by the need to improve reporting techniques, business capabilities, and information management. We found that a vast majority, collectively 80% of respondents, use periodic reporting techniques or reactive after-the-fact reporting, demonstrating that many current BI programs lack proactive investigative reporting tactics. In fact, only 20% of the survey respondents, that's the 11% and the 9% you see on this slide, um, define that they use proactive techniques as their primary means of analyzing data. Scott, I'd like to hand okay. off to you for your, your thoughts on these, uh, these responses we received. Sure, Michael. And, and this is very, you know, consistent with what we see, and, and I think it really speaks kind of the necessity of, of joining the 20 and, and leaving the 80. So, you know, think about the 80% of, of the organizations that focus on the after the fact. And I have an, an analogy I like to use here. And, you know, focusing on after the fact data is not without value. I, I mean, it, it does help us identify mistakes we've made in the past and problems and process that need to be addressed. But it keeps us on this reactive footing. And, and I ask people to imagine that, you know, they're, they're at the helm of the Exxon Valdez and they're steering it through a coastal waterway. And now I ask them to turn around and face the back of the boat 
and to only make navigation decisions from this point on by looking at the weight of the boat. And that's really what's happening in this 80% of the organizations that are, are focused exclusively on this after the fact and periodic data. Think about the, the advantage that the skipper of that boat would have if we would simply allow him to turn around and look forward to create even a poor representation of what might lie ahead instead of a very detailed assessment of, of where we've been in the past. And this is really the competitive advantage that the 20% of firms focusing on proactive are, are facing. If you know, we have a better understanding of what's ahead of the business, if we have a better understanding of what's pending in the next 30, 60, 90 days moving forward, we're going to make better decisions. And, and again, I, I think it seems obvious when you imagine the challenges of trying to drive by only looking at the rearview mirror or navigating a boat by only looking at the wake. This is really what we're asking our employees to do if we don't create these proactive analytic solutions for them to use. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. And in the next slide, we'll put a little framework about around what Scott was just describing. So again, we're still on insight number one, and we're talking about how firms want to move from what happened to why did it happen, and, and then ultimately answering what will happen through predictive analytics. So in this slide, on the uh, horizontal graph, we have our business intelligence capability, moving from low to high, left to right. And on the vertical axis, we have value achieved, again, moving from low to high as we move from low up to the upper end. Where, again, 80% of the firms are today is in the what happened box, doing, doing analytics but doing descriptive analytics, looking at current state and looking at a little bit at hindsight. And where firms would like to drive towards is where they can answer the questions, why did it happen? which we call diagnostic anal analytics and gain insight, as well as being able to get into the forecasting and foresight um, ability and answering questions such as what will happen and being able to do predictive analytics and we call them what-if analysis um, also in forecasting. Scott, your thoughts about this particular kind of model yeah, and I, way, I, way to present that, that type of discussion? Sure, yeah, absolutely. And we see lots of examples of this. I, I think if, you know, let's let's look at financial services and now think about, you know, some of those retail banking problems we're trying to solve. So how do we more effectively onboard customers? How do we better assess the, the risk and the value of making an offer to a customer? How do we begin to personalize and tailor offerings? And, you know, the more we get into trying to create uh, – a deep relationship with that customer, the more we have to talk about the predictive side of this. How are we going to guide them? How are we going to help them? Um, we see this type of, of work almost um, uh, anywhere where we're looking at risk, um, where we're trying to evaluate the best of multiple offers, um, where we're trying to actually drive revenue growth through a, a better understanding of, of customers and uh, a better appreciation of, of how they value uh, products, um, it really does require this kind of a movement. If you're going to make a, a call center more effective, you, you have to enable them to better answer a customer's question. If we're going to make a salesperson more effective, um, we, better have to, we, we have to better anticipate um, those organizations that are most willing to, to kind of bite on the current offer. Um, and, and again, I think the more we can move toward foresight, and especially foresight where we're evaluating risk, where we're personalizing and tailoring offers to unique customers, um, we're going to see a significant increase in the value we achieve with those efforts. And, you know, again, I think this graph is a pretty accurate representation of, of the, the value of what most of us are doing, this kind of what happened view. Well, it's easy to do, but it doesn't deliver a lot of great value. Um, you know, if we're really looking to drive the business forward, we have to better equip our employees to, to make good decisions and to win. And, and that really does require that we move up this curve kind of through insight and, and really focus on how do we create foresight? How do we create predictive analytics? How do we, you know, better prepare our organizations for the future? So thanks, Michael. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. 
So now we're going to move on to insight number two. Again, insight number two is around companies need to improve analytics through better reporting tools and faster data delivery. And this was one of the surprising uh, feedback areas that we received in the survey, that almost half of survey respondents, it was 45% uh, in the survey, fulfill their reporting needs through manual data extraction and data massaging using tools such as spreadsheets and data presentation in, in spreadsheets or PDF formats. And the, the key insight here is that business analysts are doing this work Many of it is you know, gathering data from multiple systems in many cases and pulling it into a, a sometimes very complex set of spreadsheets using pivot tables and other kind of anal analysts, uh, analytics tools and doing that manual data extraction. Um, you know, why do analysts do this? Number one, it's a proven in a relatively inexpensive way. Um, it does put the power in the hands of the business users to, who are sufficiently skilled to do this work. Um, and another set of respondents also provide, and that's 37% in our survey, provide standard static reporting uh, tools. You know, those are the, the standard daily, weekly, monthly, um, financial period end type of reports that companies generate. Certainly needed, certainly valuable, um, but the question is how can we get more value? And then another uh, staggering number in our survey uh, that, that we got feedback on was that less than one less than one in five respondents, it was exactly 17% in our survey, had timely access to the desired reports and analytics that they want. Let me repeat that because that was a very um, surprising number to us, that less than one in five respondents has timely, and the key word here is timely, access to the desired reports and analytics. In other words, companies are getting this work done, um, and it's getting, it's getting done, however, just not efficiently and not in the time frame that companies want to do it. So we have found that Michael, firms. Uh, I, I, yes, Scott, go ahead. I, I was going to say, I, I think you know this is this less than one in five is is really shocking, and and I think it does speak to some of the problems in in many current analytics tools, which are not just one of of technology, the using of spreadsheets, but also the the limited availability of data. So you know we tend to have. Uh, pretty narrow islands of, of data out here, especially in this model where every app and every user has some kind of custom report or or their own set of tools. So there isn't a, a scale of data. It, it's difficult to move across um, these kind of islands of information to create a more aggregated view. And then there's, you know, to your point, the timeliness of data. And and I think on the longer term trend, what we see is this recognition on the part of large enterprises that, that this type of data needs to move not just from a, a technical perspective in the better tools, but it, it needs to move from these islands kind of out on the edge of the organization to, um, to something more central that, that we can leverage more. Um, and, and that, it, you know, we need to reduce the latency uh, around that data as well. So it needs to be more timely. And, and, you know, this is a tough change. I, I think one of the reasons that we only see one in five really feeling they have this is that it's a big change for the typical organization to, to really begin to think about how do we create value out of information, not how do we do reporting, how do we do analytics, but how do we create value out of data. And, and increasingly we find that that requires that we're going to have to put data at the center that we're going to have to merge these data sets into much larger, more consistent um, uh, uh, repositories of, of information. And, you know, we need to provide better access. And, and I think for a lot of organizations, there's a real struggle on how do I get started here and, and how do I move forward on this? Because it, it's a lot to digest all at once. Yeah, we agree, Scott. Um, I would add, though, that there was some positive trending that we noted in the survey response, and that is towards companies using uh, scorecards and predictive analytics, um, using data to drill down, do slicing and dicing of data. So the dashboard and scorecard capabilities, um, we we were um, we noted that about 32 excuse me 32 percent of respondents indicated that they have or are building these reporting capabilities. So certainly a good interest and um, a good trend in that direction. 
So let me move forward to insight number three. And this is around keeping up with the competition and, and how companies are, are looking at the tools and technologies and, um, and where IT and business are partnering together. A, sign a significant number of respondents, about half, um, indicated that IT and business work together. And it also, uh, the response we got was that they will really only consider proven technologies. Um, the primary driver seems to be keeping up with the competition, um, where IT would follow technology trends, but stay focused on proven BI technologies and present those, uh, those particular tools to their business. Um, respondents did note that they use proof of concept projects to vet the technologies and determine if they meet business value requirements. So again, we view that uh, doing proof of concept projects and, and making sure they meet the business value requirements is a very positive um, indicator. Um, among respondents, 43% indicated that users must be self-sufficient and use only familiar tools, and that 20% um, of the respondents use proven technologies. Um, this suggests that a large majority, majority of respondents will only utilize the proven technologies, again, primarily to keep up with competition. And about 8% of our respondents indicated they use a proactive approach in which IT closely follows trends in you know, emerging tools and emerging processes. Scott, your thoughts on some of these feed the feedback that we got? Yeah, it, it is. I mean, it's very consistent with, with some of the data we see. But uh, again, I, I think you know, it also suggests that you know, we're at this inflection point in the market, and you know what a majority of companies are doing today is is not really probably the best course of action for them moving forward. So uh, I I think you know this idea that users must be self sufficient was really instantiated in some part by the fact that historically IT has had to build every report, and IT has had to to create a, a lot of infrastructure for reporting here. Um, and the goal was that users would become self-sufficient. I think, you know, looking forward, we have the same priority on users being self-sufficient, but it's because we have to drive kind of the cost and the latency out of the discovery process. So uh, while I, I think, you know, the trend is going to continue, the way we respond to it is going to be quite different. And, you know, we see a lot of advanced um, technologies now really trying to move the user beyond um, being a, a report author and toward more of an explorer, more of uh, someone that, that can really browse and navigate, uh, you know, repositories to, to help them find the information they're looking for. Um, the proven technology is absolutely true, um, but I, I think it's interesting to note that, you know, especially in the advent of cloud and, and big data services here, um, we do find that line of business is beginning um, to exert some budgetary authority um, without IT. Um, and the line of business owners are looking for very specific types of analytics and services. So, it, you know, the risk here is for an IT organization that can't move forward um, as aggressively as its end users wish to, if, if they can't produce the agility that their users require, um, that end users are, you know, beginning to work around IT as well. Um, you know, the 8% that get it, I think, you know, we find that in, in every market. Um, there is a set of first movers. There are a set of leaders. Um, the changes in the analytics marketplace now, um, whether it's technologies and, and increasingly in services, our ability to do analytics with services versus significant capital investments in, in new hardware and software, um, creates all kinds of new opportunities. And I do see most of our large customers really beginning to explore um, it, you know, the newest trends and tools and processes and really looking to take advantage of not just new technologies but new deployment models and, and new service models as a result of cloud and the increasing availability of high-quality uh, professional services in this area. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. <clears throat> so now I'm going to move on to insight number four, and this is around where BI is fits in terms of its strategic and enterprise-wide importance in organizations. Feedback from the survey indicated that a quarter of respondents noted that BI projects are strategic and are aligned with enterprise-wide goals. One trend among the respondents appears towards projects being managed at the department level 
but with links towards enterprise-wide priorities and goals. I view this as an important trend and a very positive factor. While tactical data marts are certainly a starting point, maturing these to meet enterprise-wide objectives is where the most value can be achieved. Scott, your thoughts around companies' value and linking that to enterprise-wide initiatives? Sure, and and it's you know it is surprising to me as as you know we've watched this market. I, I think you know often um, we looked at BI tools as you know these departmental programs, these reporting programs, the data mark programs, and I, I think there was a, a period of time where you know we talked about this a little earlier where we kind of left the analytics and the reporting to the end of the project, and then we bolted it on to the outside, onto the edge, and. You know, we created these information technology architectures where we had lots of islands of automation around the edge of the of the organization to support individual users. And increasingly, I, I think we see a recognition now that that data is way too valuable to be federated out into a bunch of little pieces on a bunch of different departments and desktops. And there is a movement toward beginning to identify data valuable to the enterprise and, and really bringing that more into the center. Um, we spend a lot more time now talking about analytics as architecture and analytics as a platform service um, than we ever have in the past. And, and I don't mean organizations that are necessarily talking about maybe a, a big enterprise data warehouse in the sky, but organizations trying to identify what are the most valuable data uh, elements to, to share, um, what are the significant sources of, of that data, um, how are we going to manage it and govern it to create some stewardship, and how are we going to share it. And I, I do think, you know, certainly over the next few years, we're going to talk more and more about analytics as architecture. We're going to talk more about putting data at the center. Um, and I think this is all going to be with an eye toward how do we create value out of the information we're already handling and storing. That's excellent, Scott. And as you noted about data stewardship, and that's a great lead into our insight number five, that certainly one of the hot topics we noted in the survey was that data stewardship and data governance are very hot topics. 22% uh, of the respondents see the increased need for data stewardship with data management support for all organizations. And for those that may not be familiar with our definition of data governance, but it's really around having owners of data and to drive the consistency in the organization and reduce that, you know, disparate manual uh, efforts to, um, you know, reconcile data across uh, different systems and have a, a complete kind of organization data structure and data model. Scott, your thoughts around data stewardship and data governance in organizations today? Yeah, I, I think, you know, data stewardship is, is probably uh, an area that most organizations don't, really fun to the to the degree that's necessary um, early on in these projects is we've worked with many organizations going through uh, a transformation of their analytics environment and to a company at the end of the process when we sit them down and debrief them around so so what are the lessons you learned what do you really feel are best practices what are things you wouldn't wouldn't do um, Every single company I've worked with on a significant transformation of their analytics environment says, you know, we wished we spent more time on data management and governance early on. That uh, there are so many conflicting sources of data. There are so many disparate systems. Um, that without really a firm handle on the, the data stewardship issue from the very beginning, um, these projects take longer cost more, and, and they're harder to execute as a result of really shortchanging that part of the process. So, it, you know, I, I'd encourage people not to, to hesitate to invest there, um, not to, to make the, the data management and governance exercise an afterthought, but really put that kind of front and center in the early days of the project. And I, I think you're going to, you know, realize a, a pretty good economic savings by the end of that project as, as a result of that. Great advice, Scott. So now I'm going to move on to insight number six. And this is around defining your goal BI maturity level to better compete. Um, I realize this slide has a lot of information on it, but just a quick overview of the structure. 
On the uh, horizontal axis on the left-hand side, we have the technology capabilities and technology enablement. On the right-hand bottom side, we have our business and functional capabilities. And um, again, moving to the right, the additional capabilities on that. And then moving up the vertical axis, we have what we call our program management capabilities. Um, in our BI maturity model, we go from what we call level one to level five um, capabilities. Level one is kind of what we call our basic level uh, capabilities. Level five would be enterprise and best in class. Um, from our survey responses, we noted that about half the our respondents were somewhere between level one and level two. Um, about 25% of our survey respondents uh, feel that they consider themselves between levels two and three. Now, what's important here is not so much where you are from your company's capabilities today, but really about what your aspirations and where the value is from your investments in BI. Um, we would certainly look at this and not recommend that a company has to be level five, for example. Um, moving from a, a level two to level three could gain significant advantage and significant value for a company. And so, again, this is a framework around how to analyze where your requirements are, where your investments would best be um, realized in terms of the value to the organization. And again, one of our best practices, and we'll talk more about this in a minute, is around making sure you have a solid business case and a solid program to make these BI investments. Um, companies are not going to go from level one to level three, for example, in one project. Many, many times that's a program. Many, projects link, many times that's linking from a department level um, value to enterprise level value and looking at a, a program roadmap of incremental value added projects to be able to get to the desired BI state. So this is a framework, again, that we, that we use to help guide our survey questions. Um, it's a framework we, we talk to our clients about, um, about how to define their BI roadmap initiatives. And uh, we look forward to uh, talking more about that with you. Um, Scott, any thoughts just about this model? And I know we have some more slides to help further explain this. Yeah, I, I do think, you know, it's important to, to reinforce the idea that, you know, the model isn't showing you kind of small, discrete steps here. I mean, to move from one level to another is probably a combination of programs. Um, it probably requires the, the work of a, a number of concerned departments and individuals. And I, I think the programmatic view of, of we're going to do, you know, many small projects along the way here makes a lot of sense. Um, I, I do think it, it really is important to keep track of what we're trying to do. Uh, I think often when we go out to make analytics investments, um, end users, you know, have trouble kind of seeing the future. Um, and I don't mean the IT folks necessarily, but the actual users of the data. So, you know, they might want more reports, and, and what we really need to talk to them about is why static reporting really isn't a good solution to their problem. So what would a, a scorecard for their department look like? What would be the, the most actionable piece of information we could provide on an account level? Um, and really begin to work with the business units to define what that, let's say, level two to level three movement would, would mean, what it would look like, and what kind of business objectives did we hope to, to achieve by, by making that movement? That's great. Scott, I'm going to ask you to stay on that topic and discuss the value of moving up that BI maturity curve to organizations. Sure. Sure. And, and you know, there's no – I think we all understand the limitations of, of kind of tactical, static, you know, reporting. Um, and, and while, you know, all of those reports exist for a reason, um, it, it really is difficult to turn them into value – in a customer exchange. It's difficult to turn them into value when we have a problem that we're trying to solve. And, you know, I think we see this enhanced value uh, of truly integrated, more real-time BI solutions. And, you know, you begin to achieve significant value when we can create this shared version of the truth, when we can really begin to measure and, and monitor our, our performance 
to create this competitive advantage we're looking at. You know, so many possible improvements here better using data. All right, if we're looking at data in, in real time, we're gonna, gonna avoid many of the kind of reconciliation processes we have to do by hand or, or to, to move from where our last report was to where we think we are today. Um, we're gonna save tremendous amount of time by automating these. We're gonna increase productivity and profitability, and typically the way I say we're gonna do this is we're gonna put data in the hands of people making the decision. All right, what's the point of giving someone a report two weeks after the fact that says, ah, we missed an opportunity to cross-sell this product. Ah, we missed an opportunity to engage with this customer on this issue. Ah, we priced this incorrectly because we didn't consider this type of risk. And we see all these cases now where we use static data to try to dynamically move forward in the marketplace. So if we need to quickly adapt, if we're gonna to try to effectively utilize our historic data, um, if we're gonna to try to reduce the cost of answers, um, we have to begin to create process qualities improvements that are based on data, that produce more predictable outcomes and deliver improved customer service. So it, you know, there's tremendous advantage here, but only if we can put the data in the hands of the decision maker, only if we can put the data in the hands of the rep on the phone with the customer. And you know, the closer we can move to that insightful and ultimately predictive and proactive data environment, the more effective we can be in the marketplace. But this is hard, because what we're talking about now is centralizing, merging data, that comes from many disparate sources. So data governance is really imperative to creating this kind of culture shift. Um, once you begin to create this capability, everyone wants it. So we have to begin to think about what are the priorities here to really create and, and enhance business value? Um, where are the places where we can most easily turn information into value? Where are the places we can most effectively turn value from an information perspective into economic value? Um, and increasingly, you know, who are the partners that are gonna help us do this? You know, as, as we're finding, um, you know, th there's a lot to be added by the service providers in this marketplace. I think many uh, of the 80% the that, that we spoke of maybe somewhat disparagingly in the beginning as really relying on a historical view of static data. Well, the reason they're there is the forward movement is hard. It, it requires that we have an advanced view of our business, that we have an advanced view of technology, um, that we have the capability and the organizational resources to move forward effectively. And, you know, for many organizations, while there's the will, um, and the resources, what they're, they're missing is the, the skills um, and the, the technologies. So, you know, service providers um, are, are doing a great job kind of coming into this market. Um, you know, certainly um, SunGuard is one of them, and, and they have a number of accelerators and frameworks here. But I, I think, you know, the important thing is to, to find uh, a partner, to find a set of engaging products and projects, and, you know, to find a goal that are, are really going to help drive your organization up this maturity curve because the, the economic advantages of getting there are pretty significant. Thanks, Link. Thank you, Scott. So now we just have um, a little bit left for the uh, conclusion of the, the formal part of our presentation. And one of the topics that Scott and I wanted to cover was around BI program best practices. Um, this is a list of six. Um, certainly there are a few more, but I just wanted to highlight just a few um, best practices around how to improve the ROI of your BI data warehouse projects. And, and certainly one is fitting your business intelligence and investments to your strategy by using a, that BI maturity chart that I just showed um, a couple slides before around your BI maturity goals in terms of investing in the right things in an incremental way. Um, design leveraging a proven industry business model, as we call it. And basically that's a, a starter behind the data model and modeling your business and the structure of bringing in all this data from various operational systems. 
we certainly recommend leveraging what we call an agile type approach, which is basically looking at incremental value-added projects that can be completed in a you know, relatively shorter time frame and not having to have the big project that you have to wait a long time to deliver. And by the time you do, it's uh, the requirements for the users have changed. So increment in that agile, iterative manner. Um, we certainly recommend having transparency into investment decisions that have a clear ROI. Um, too many times we find that clients will uh, do a BI project by you know, implementing a BI tool, implementing some new capabilities in some of the tools, enterprise-wide tools they may have licenses to. But really, at the end of the day, the value is going to be in what gets achieved for your business and the value of the information and the potential better process that's enabled. So have that clear ROI, have that partnership with the business and business sponsorship. Um, certainly design for the BI capabilities versus transactional reporting. And, you know, leverage existing, existing investments in BI tools. Um, many times, at least when we work with clients, they've already made an investment in a particular enterprise-wide BI tool. Um, but it's around taking that investment and getting out of individual data marts or individual one-off BI projects and, and linking that to the enterprise-wide value that the data and these tools can give you. Scott, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think, you know, we've touched on a lot of this as we've gone through, but uh, again, I think maybe to to reiterate a few, it, it's not about IT building more reports. It, it's about um, becoming more agile. It, it's about reducing latency and creating value out of information. And to do that, you know, we really do have to engage with line of business. Um, you know, line of business uh, managers um, have a, a great sense of, of what would be valuable for them. They, they just don't know how to go get it. Um, I, I think also, um, you know, we, we really do have to look at creating clear, identifiable um, success criteria and, and really going after very specific, you know, return on investment scenarios. So, you know, to I, I think the broader point here is, um, you know, be focused on, on moving quickly, um, be focused on a, a proof of concept and, and early wins in the project to, to build momentum and enthusiasm, um, and, and really do um, fight to gain insight, fight to, to gain a view of the future. It, it's often when these projects begin to bog down, it becomes easy to, to kind of settle for yet another static reporting answer here, and that's just not going to meet the needs of the, of the, trans, of the users. We, you know, really need to move away kind of from transactional reporting into what I would call maybe more of a, a data-enabled decision-making, of, of putting data at that point of decision. And the more we can do that, the more engaged our, our uh, customers are going to be, um, the, the happier they're going to be, um, and, and the more likely we are to continue to do business with them. I mean, we've all had the the frustration of dealing with the clueless supplier. And it, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's in our role as consumers or as business people. Um, if it takes a long time to figure out the answer, if it doesn't seem like you really know who I am, you're not engaged. And, and you know, increasingly, um, expectations in, in uh, business settings are, are really being changed by some of the new technologies that people are exposed to every day. Um, they expect it to be easy to access, access information. They expect it to be available to them quickly. Um, they expect to be able to use it to make decisions. And, you know, while we build that expectation in, in consumers, it's also there in our employees and our customers. And, you know, we, I think this set of best practices would go a long way toward moving us in that direction. Excellent. Thank you, Scott. Just very quickly, how can SunGuard help your organization? You know, we actively engage in clients with our clients and projects to help them assess their BI maturity, their approach, and a roadmap to get the value. You know, in in this approach, we look, we help you answer questions about where you are with regards to the wider industry that you work in, um, helping you define a BA strategy that in, in, um, indeed can be a game changer how to move your organization to being BI value-driven, 
And to do this, we would recommend just a complimentary half-day workshop with our organization where our consultants can uh, work with your team and review where you are in your BI maturity and your desired levels and what it would take to create a roadmap to define the initiatives to, uh, to help your organization get that value. So on behalf of Scott and myself, that concludes our formal part of the presentation. Uh, thank you again for listening in. We will uh, stay on the line here for another 15 minutes and answer questions. And we will open the line for questions. And our operator, Emma, will be happy to uh, guide us in that process. Again, thank you, everyone. At this time, we would like to take any questions you might have for us today. To ask a question via the web, click the green Q&A button on the lower left-hand corner of your screen, type your question in the open area, and click Send to Submit. Hi, everyone. This is Mike Wolk, and now we're going to start our question and answer session. The first question we have is, what is the best way to start evaluating or understanding the current BI maturity of a firm? And this is what I was just discussing in the, uh, the prior slide and the uh, BI maturity model. I'll use that as a starting point. The, um, the way our model works is we have a set of questions behind the dimensions of the business value, the technology enablement, and the program management capabilities. And this is how we based our survey that we discussed today. And what uh, we would recommend is, again, using our survey questions, we can generate the, uh, you know, the kind of as is, if you will, of where your firm is. And then start evaluating where you are and what it would take and what levels would make the best sense for your firm. And then as Scott was highlighting, you know, certainly come up with the defined value and business cases that needed to justify the investments and to gain executive sponsorship and business sponsorship to, the, to these initiatives. Our next question is, are BI, analytics, and big data the same thing? Scott, I'll ask you for your perspective on that. Sure. And, and from a, you know, an IDC perspective, we spend a lot of time talking about why these things are, are different. But the reality is these terms are, are often used interchangeably. And I do think that, you know, there is some, some shades of gray here. I think often when people talk about BI, I, I, my experience is they're talking about desktop reporting tools. Um, analytics, um, we, we tend to, to have more um, going on kind of behind the client. Um, typically, we'd find more structured um, repositories, although, again, these terms are used very much interchangeably. And then our view of, of big data is it is somewhat unique that, you know, when we are talking about the big data environment, um, we're talking about data that, that has volume, um, that has value, um, that has velocity um, and variability. And, you know, we do require some, some unique technologies and, and capabilities to work with that. I think the reality is in aggressive kind of leading organizations here, um, they really are trying to blur these distinctions. Um, the reality is that desktop reporting tools have led to, you know, kind of this tremendous federation of data in the organization. And, you know, often I think getting started, one of the things you have to do is simply to understand the scale and the scope of that. And I think many organizations have kind of stealth or, or shadow BI and reporting out there. And they might be shocked to find out how many different tools are in use, how many different small repositories exist. So, you know, we have to get the lay of the land. Um, and then even if we're going to continue to maintain these islands, um, we have to recognize that some of that data is valuable to others. And I think this is where big data really comes in. As we begin to look at the variety, uh, the broad range of all the different federated data sources we may have within our own organization, we begin to look at data from third parties. So what could we do with uh, data from a service? Um, 
And then finally, what are we doing with our own unstructured data? Think about customer comments in a call center scenario. Think about data that we might bring in um, from financial markets, um, trading information. Um, all of this is, is structured differently. And we do find that big data tools, um, very important um, cost savings tools and enablers. When we try to merge all of this federated to data together in a central repository. So I think you know a couple different shades of gray here. I think often users use these terms interchangeably. Um, but to me, the, the goal is to really figure out how we move this data from the edge to the center, um, how we begin to leverage this data more widely across the organization. Um, and to do that, we're all going to wind up sticking our toes in this thing called big data. And you know that really is something worth coming up to speed on. Great, Scott. Thank you. And um, I want to thank everyone for asking questions. We actually have um, quite a few questions that have come in online. Um, however, unfortunately, we're almost out of time for our webcast today. So really just have time for maybe one question. And um, I'm going to summarize a, a little bit longer question here. And Scott, look at your perspective. It's um, uh, did your survey return any sense of the techniques that individual executives or firms are using to focus on the human to information interface? And basically, the, you know, the, the, the focus of this question is you know, what techniques are um, analysts are using or being taught to explore the data instead of, instead of just looking at reports? Sure. And I think there are a variety of different um, visualization tools. Um, typically, uh, any of the, the big data providers typically will have visualization components to, to help you navigate and, and explore um, those data sets. But I also think you know, we're, we're going beyond simply reporting here, and we're looking at how do we incorporate data in the dialogue with the customer? How do we incorporate data in a business process? Um, and increasingly, um, we find that uh, mashups and um, other uh, on-screen kind of technologies are being used to bring analytics directly into the transactional environment. So uh, a call center operator will see more detailed data about best possible offers um, for this customer. Um, uh, uh, service um, capability will show the specific history of this customer and, and what the most likely cause of this particular problem is. Um, so this notion that we can bring analytics into the interactions um, where we're making business decisions um, really, to me, is kind of the edge of where we are right now. Um, many of the services firms have begun to engage um, folks that really we haven't seen outside of the commercial development environments before. So PhDs in human factors, um, experts in uh, interface design. Um, and we find that the way we view this data is really, again, being tempered by the experience of people in the marketplace. They expect to, to be able to access this information on a device. So technologies like cloud and mobile become important. Um, they expect to see the data in context. So this idea that we can mash up both transactional apps and analytics become important. Um, and increasingly, I, I think most companies are looking to third parties to bring some of this technology into the organization. So really relying on service providers. And you think about the challenges of what we've talked about here. Um, you know, we probably need someone like a data scientist to begin to think about some of these stewardship and governance issues. What are the sources of, of this data from a, a creation perspective? What are the systems of record for managing it? How is it used? Um, we need experts in, in user interface design to address some of these human factors issues. Um, we may well need people to work with line of business to define exactly where data would create value. And I think for the average IT organization, this is really kind of beyond what they've been asked to provide in the past. So we see a lot of these pilots being done with suppliers. Um, I think increasingly we see pilots being done in the cloud um, on, um, on, on hosted infrastructure because of the, the agility and the, the low cost of, of piloting there. 
And then once we've created a, a really viable solution, then we can look at the economies of where does that reside? Do we continue to host it? Do we bring it in-house and put it in a private cloud? Um, but I, I do think that you know, lots of organizations struggle with how do we bring valuable data kind of in line to the decisioning process. And instead of having separate reports, how do we bring reporting right into the, the daily interface that users use to do their job? Thank you, Scott. Um, we are at the top of the hour and just wanted to close out. On, and so on behalf of Scott and myself, we'd like to thank you again for joining us and participating in our discussion today. Uh, we did get a number of questions that came in online, and uh, we will be following up directly uh, by email with you and uh, providing our thoughts and, and comments. So greatly appreciate that. I um, also would like to uh, just note that you can download the full survey report at our, uh, our website. It's uh, sunguard.com backslash BI maturity. And, or you could contact us at consulting at sunguard.com. Again, for, on behalf of Scott and myself, thank you very much. Um, look forward to uh, further conversations on this topic. And thank you, and goodbye for now. Thanks to all our participants for joining us today. We hope you found this webcast presentation informative. This concludes our webcast. You may now disconnect. Have a good day.